Now that I was a government minister with an increased workload, I felt it was even more important to try to stay fit and stick to my regular routine of an early morning jog at least three times a week. One morning not long after my elevation, I returned sweating to my car after a particularly grueling run, having decided to sprint the final 150 yards. Sitting breathless in the driver's seat, I watched in the wing mirror as a police car pulled up silently behind me. One of its two occupants got out, came over to my car and greeted me through the open window. Good morning, sir, the policeman said pleasantly. Is this your car? Yes, officer, I replied with my usual cheery deference to authority. Why, is there a problem? We've been caught with a burglary on the other side of the park, he told me. Tapping the details of my car into a handheld gizmo, a man was seen by the householder running away. And as we arrived, we spotted you in the vicinity, running very fast. What's your address, sir? As he tapped in the address I recited, I suddenly realised that the address for the registered owner of the car wouldn't be the one I'd just given him. My sister-in-law had a new company car every few years as one of the perks of her job, was allowed to do what she liked with the old one. I bought her Mondeo gear with its electric sunroof and 10-stack CD player, but hadn't yet completed the change of ownership form, the V something or other that had to be sent to the DVLA. I sat there hoping that by some divine intervention the car would be registered at my address, but of course it wasn't. This car doesn't appear to belong to you at all, sir. <laughs> the policeman said, his tone of polite irony suggesting that the computer had merely confirmed his strong suspicion. It was then that I made the mistake of seeking refuge in pomposity. I explained the disparity, offering my sister-in-law's address as proof that I was telling the truth. But ending with the ill-advised words, anyway, officer, if you care to check, you'll find that I'm a member of parliament and a government minister. The policeman paused and gazed across the verdant parkland before leaning down at the window to deliver his devastating response. But that doesn't mean you're a stranger to criminality. <laughs> doesn't that, sir? He turned, gizmo in hand, to walk back to the police car consult his colleague while I sat bathed in sweat from the run and drowning in the scorn of my interrogator. They probably left me stewing in my own juice for longer than was strictly necessary before the officer returned to deliver the final blow. Okay, so we've now received a full description of the miscreant. He was young and slim, he can go. <laughs> From the long winding road, which is the third volume, and now onto volume four. Just I started my first band when I was at school. It was called the Vampires, and it was just a crowd bunch of schoolmates. The drummer Jimmy Rock was so bad it reminded me of John Lennon's riposte about Pete Best. John Lennon was very acerbic about drummers. He, when someone said he's Ringo Starr, the best drummer in the world, he said he's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. <laughs> but he's, he was even more damn about Pete Best, of course, got sidelined for Ringo. He said, John Lennon said, uh, what's the similarity between Pete Best and a chiropodist? And the answer is, a chiropodist bucks up your feet. <laughs> <laughs> It will sink in by the time you <laughs> I happened to be at this book festival rather like this being interviewed uh, in Monmouth. And I said how Jimmy Bob was such a useless drummer. And this little voice in the audience said, I'm here, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any ex-members of the band party? So they just put their hand on. Um, and but eventually I got an electric guitar because uh, I'd gone through the Lonnie Donegan phase. I can see a few fellow baby boomers here. I went through that classic kind of phase. My mum, when she had a little pool's wing, uh, when I was seven or eight, she bought my sister a dance set record player. And she bought me a Spanish guitar, with which came Burt Whedon's play in the day. <laughs> we prosecuted under the trade description. <laughs> play in a decade, maybe. So I was completely self-taught with that. But when we were starting the band fights, of course, I needed an electric guitar. And after my, anyone read this morning, I know my mother had a very hard life. And
and she died. But she was always there. Her mother had died at 42. Her grandmother had died at 42. My mother was convinced she would die at the age of 42, and she did. And, and as a result of that, just digressing just a little. So we lived in North Kensington. Uh, and this boy, I had to differentiate between North Kensington and Notting Hill. You know, we didn't have Hugh Grant or Julie Roberts around our way very much. Notting Hill is kind of west of Adam, the very posh end of Ladbroke Grove, Portobello Road. West 10 is where Grenfell Tower. Now, tragically, people know where West 10 is now because of Grenfell, which, which was built almost on the spot of the last slum near my sister lived in, 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 in West London. And you know, here's a, here's a fact. We know all about health inequalities now. We didn't know that. Then, then, a boy born in North Kensington would die on average 16 years earlier than a boy in South Kensington. That's one London borough. You know, you want to think how obscene these health inequalities still are in the 21st century. So, um, which was fine, except two weeks after my mum died, this offer of a council house that she dreamed of all her life, her own front door, you know, instead of sharing a house with six or seven families, one, two rooms each. This offer of a council house in Wellington Island City. So the cover was blown kind of thing, because my sister marched straight up to the council. My sister was only 15, by the way, I think. She just turned 16. I said, my mum's dead, but me and my brother went this council house. Uh, and the council official said, that he said that the age of majority there was 21. And he said, I'll send someone around. No, no, I'll send someone around. Into our life came a social worker called Mr. Pepper. Not Sergeant Pepper, but Mr. Pepper. And Mr. Pepper came, I'll get back to the guitar in a minute. Mr. Pepper came into our front room at Walker Road, practically where the Grenfell Tower is today, and said, well, You've done something wrong. He made this little presentation to me and my sister. Alan, I found foster parents for you, New York School in Chelsea. Linda, who left school at 15 to train to be a nursery nurse, you can go to Dr. Bernardo's at Barking, it's a big headquarters, and you can train to be a nursery nurse and you can live there as well. My sister flew into it, kind of, you know, hand on the hips, finger wagging. And she said, You're not going to split us up. And he said, You can't be on your own. She said, We've got our own for years, which we had because my mum was in it. Possible. In fact, you read this boy, you'll see my sister cooked my Christmas dinner when she was eight and I was five because we were our own. And dear old Mr. Pepper, uh, uh, there may be social workers here. Social workers tell me this could not happen today. Mr. Pepper went away and got us a flat with two of us. He told my sister, he said to Linda, you go and look at this flat. And the council must have thought two bits of kids would be in the worst place you've got on the books. So my sister said, so dreadful. They'd taken the doors off to burn as firewood. So my indomitable sister went straight to the phone box, rang Mr. Pepper, put her four pins in, pressed the button and I Mr. Pepper, you know how she said about this place we're not accepting it? He said, you can't negotiate with me yet, but you know what I've been through to get you this? And she said, well, you go and look at it. If you think you can live there with your family, come and look me in the eye and tell me, and I'll think about it. Never heard about that place again. We've got this lovely two-bedroom masonette, you know, that 11 pit house on the Royal Force Estate in Battersea, which meant we had to go south of the Thames. That was very traumatic for us. We've got home. <laughs> <laughs> and I did this, it's back to the guitar. I did this milk round with a guy called Johnny Carter. And Johnny Carter, my sister and his brother, Jimmy Carter. And Johnny, they were a tough family around North Kensington. Their dad was a to rag and bone with him, so to him. In fact, he swore that that horse in Step on the Sun, Hercules, that he had sold it to the BBC. <laughs> and it was to but Johnny had settled down now. He'd married her two kids, he was a milkman, and he wanted an assistant. So I helped Johnny with his milkman at the weekends. Uh, and he was like, he was a converted teddy boy, but he still had the Tony Curtis with the DA at the back. Yeah, the D stood for ducks, so you know what the A stood for. <laughs> And as he drove the milk for it, which went very slowly, he would be leaning out, looking in the big mirror, just making sure he's in the <laughs> Anyway, Johnny got to do a paraffin round with him two nights a week to get some money. Paraffin might have to be explained to a younger generation. <coughs> so there was blue paraffin and pink paraffin, and there was wool between the two. So I'd go out Tuesday night, Thursday night, to help Johnny with the paraffin round, and I'd go out weekends to help him with the milk round. 
now that we were moving to Battersea, I couldn't do that again. He never said a word about the story to the back in my way. In fact, you know, working class brothers didn't do that, especially around my way, North Kensington. But he said, when we finish the work, I'll come back to my place. I've got something for you. So he went back to his house in St. Anne's Road. He took me down in the basement, opened the doors, and there was this vast array of brand new musical instruments. There were drums and saxophones and trumpets and electric guitars. Now, in his spare time, John may have been a distributor for a musical instrument company. Um, <laughs> Gingham case, and I borrowed Linda's lipstick and wrote the vampires across it, and I was away. And then the next step was the area, which was a proper band, where we had a, a the, the lead singer was really old. He was 20. Um, <laughs> I was.